そしてこれが究極のダイエットドリンク一日コップ一杯飲み続けるだけで太らずにどんどん痩せることができるんでございます何の制限もなく食べたいだけ食べられる Listen to me, Hatcher. You gotta tell him Silent Green is people! Welcome, I am the Kaiju no Kami, and today I am doing a very special look at Shop Factory's newest DVD release, Choroki Sentai O-Ranger. For those of you that may not know, this is what became Power Ranger Zio in America. Not only was O-Ranger the follow-up to Kaku Ranger, but it also signaled the 20th anniversary of the Sentai franchise, and as such, Toei brought in writers from all the previous series to contribute to such a grand celebration. Toei's initial plan was to make one of the darkest Sentai series to ever grace Japanese airwaves, which is shown in its opening sequence. <laughs> In the year 1999, Baranoia attacks the Earth and nearly conquers it until the O-Rangers stop their vicious assault. Unfortunately, tragedy occurred as Japan was riddled with an earthquake that ripped through Kobe in January of 1995 and then was followed up with a terrorist attack in a Tokyo subway two months later. As such, the tone of the show has changed several episodes in, giving us a very jarring experience in the span of one episode. One moment O-Ranger goes all Videodrome on us, only to have a real stinker of an episode afterwards. Where are you, my studs, dear cat of love? All over I am looking someplace for you. Where does it that you are secreting its ill view? And it continues. We go from this... To this... <sighs> this constant change cost the show viewers and it ended up being Toei's lowest rated Sentai show at the time, which would last until 2012's Go Busters. However, is O Ranger really so bad that it deserved to have those terrible ratings for 15 years? Let's start breaking the show down to find out. The Heroes. Given the nature of these shows, you need a really strong cast of characters to act as our heroes. O-Ranger has as each of the Rangers is part of a militaristic organization known as the United Air Force Overtech Hardware, or UAOH for short. These people are not ordinary civilians, they are soldiers. As such, you would expect them to all have strong personalities and fighting spirits, which they do. The problem stems from the fact that because they are all strong characters, they have little in the way of flaws, which means there is little room for growth. It does not matter if you are the strong commander like Goro Hoshino. Played by Masaru Shishindo, the train fire that Kunio Masaoka portrays as Shohei Yokaichi. Yuji Mita, Masashi Goda is the team's more immature member. Ayumi Aso plays our first female Yellow Ranger in years, Jiri Nijo. Finally, Tamao Sato provides us with the team's youngest member of the group, who is also the standard female ranger archetype in Momo Maru. Surprisingly, Momo is by far the most developed of the rangers as she is really the only one we truly learn a lot about before she joined up with UAOH. Sure, we get an episode with a bit of backstory on Shuhei, but she is really the only one that fits in the realms of being developed. Goro is a fine red ranger, but he was an exceptional leader just as much in the final episode as he was in the first episode. There really wasn't anything that wows the viewer as far as their personalities go. They're all kind of bland. The most I know about Yuji is that he wishes he had a little brother. Jerry might be a strong female character, but she is as deep as a sheet of paper. It's kind of a shame since their powers come from an ancient civilization that lived on Earth during the time when the continents were all one under the name of Pangea. That is a far more interesting concept than the rangers themselves. In addition, each ranger gets their powers from a different mythological being. O Reds is from a phoenix, O Green gets his from the Greek bull Taurus, a sphinx powers O Blue, the Maui head statue from 
of Easter Island is what gives All Pink her power while All Yellow is empowered by a Dogu statue from Japan's Jomon period. In fact, it's pretty interesting that the Rangers utilize supernatural powers from ancient civilizations to battle a highly advanced race of machines, making one wonder if this was a social commentary on how the old world was changing from the old ways to following modern technology. The suit designs throughout the show are fine. Each Ranger has a shape on their helmet that counts up which number they are. All Pink's a circle, All Yellow's two ovals, All Blue has a triangle, All Green's a rectangle, and All Red has a star. The rest of the suits are pretty much the same for all the Rangers with the exception of the skirts on pink and yellow. They are also armed to the teeth and weaponry from their standard king blasters, king sticks that double as swords. Each ranger has a personalized armament, be it a sword, tonfa, or shield, to a giant wheel, and then a giant cannon that just randomly shows up in one episode without any backstory. And that is just one of the many gripes I do have with this show, as their weaponry will just appear without any purpose, any explanation, any introduction. There's a simple explanation for that. That's your argument for every plot convenience. Look, in Old Ranger they had to actually earn their upgraded weapons when their weapons deteriorated from time. Die Ranger, you actually see them build their cannon, and that's how they got it. Here, it's just there. So don't give me that there's a perfectly good explanation for it, and not give me one. Back to the review. The Rangers are led by their commander, Nayuki Mira, whom you may be familiar with for Hiroshi Miyachi plays this man. Miyachi was previously seen in Gold Ranger as Owl Ranger, Jaka as Big One, and he was the title heroes in both Zubat and Kamen Rider V3. Finally, like Jew Ranger and Die Ranger, the second half of the show brings in a sixth Ranger known as King Ranger. King Ranger is a kid by the name of Ricky, who lived as a protector to a girl named Doran billions of years ago when Pangea was around and the duo were put into hibernation. They wake up to put an end to Bacchus' wrath's villainy and end up joining forces with the Old Rangers. Toy Genshin! <laughs> Riki, played by Hisashi Sakai, isn't an immature brat like Cole was in Die Ranger, but he also isn't all that interesting of a character since he too is never really developed beyond his debut. <laughs> Thankfully, he has Doran by his side, who is able to provide us with a wide array of emotions such as crying, pouting, being sad, and uh, just staring blankly at the situations going on. <laughs> Oh, but I did forget that she does occasionally manage to crack her face into a slight smirk. Hey, it's not much, but you know what? Considering the other options, I'll take it. On the subject of non-rangers, another interesting aspect the show has is with some reoccurring characters. First, there is a boy named Mikio who shows up every so often. This is a rarity. Usually the children of the week are one-offs, so having a child that the rangers already know makes the plot feel a little bit more realistic, since it isn't just some random boy that just happens to know the rangers. The same goes for the unluckiest family in the world known as the Nita family. Their home always seems to get invaded by a Bara monster. Oh, and there is a professor who loves machines, played by series alumni Soichiro Akaboshi. The villains. As I previously mentioned, the villains of the show is called Baranoia, and they are actually a machine empire, which is actually pretty damn cool. They are kind of interesting, for they are an old-fashioned monarchy with their king being Bacchus Wrath, his wife the Queen Hysteria, their child is Prince Bolant, and they have a duel of jesters known as Kocha and Acha. Kazunheit. Bacchus Wrath proves his villainy right off the bat as the show opens with him attacking the Earth and nearly conquering it. Unfortunately, there isn't too much to go on for the next 30 episodes as Bacchus constantly fails and the plots can get really downright dumb at times with ideas like using the cries of babies, disrupting traffic, and trying to make people fall in love with their electronics. Ooh. Wow. Hello, nurse. Ooh. Even better.
Awkward. Thankfully, there are times when Bacchus is downright brutal, such as when he tortured the brother to one of his minions for their failure. Will anyone else attempt to fill his shoes? And when he hunted down a pile of junk that came to life. As the series progresses, we learn that he was created by Pangea. He's not the most interesting leader, but he is one of the more ruthless ones. Not to mention he was voiced by Toru Ahira, who was not only the narrator to the first several Sentai series, but was also the Japanese voice for both Homer Simpson and Darth Vader, until he died earlier this year. 2016, you suck! Hysteria doesn't really do much of anything until the last quarter of the series, but even then, what she does do is minimal. Most of the time she just stands around getting annoyed when things don't go her way, or when Bacchus Wrath is just sleeping. In fact, she is probably the prototype of the useless female villain that plagues Sentai these days. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> you don't? Oh, well, you see it's because she's a machine. And being that, um, never mind, the joke is lost. Surprisingly, Bodunt is the character in the show that obtains the most growth. Without trying to give away too much, he goes from spoiled little brat to world-conquering adult. It's quite interesting to watch the transition occur and you would have never expected it due to the series' ever-changing tone. Also, if you're an Escaflone fan, you may recognize his adult voice as matching Von Fennell, for Tomokazu Seki voices him. Seki has been a huge name in the anime world thanks to his many roles such as Doman Kashu in G Gundam, Toji Suzahara in Evangelion, Rob Lucci in One Piece, Sasuke Sagara in Full Metal Panic, Kyo Soma in Fruits Basket, Yizak in Gundam Seed, Gilgamesh in Fate Zero, and Shinya Kogami in Psycho Pass. He has also made a ton of Toku appearances, such as being the voice of Bibi Debbie in Mega Ranger and the voice of the Gokaider equipment. Our main cast of villains end with Kocha and Acha, who are given machine enhancements to make the Bera monsters grow. <laughs> This is Tron. Tron is doing well. Very well indeed. That's because not long ago, with just a quick phone call, Tron realized he could have something better in his life. Why a big boost of confidence, a little more self-esteem, and very happy mistresses at home. To learn more about Robograd, go to robograd.mechanic.org. Robograd, from the makers of Incest Away Body Spray. There's not really too much to them aside from them being the bumbling idiots, although they are fun characters. There are a few others that appear later on in the series, such as Bomber the Great, who tries to take Baranoia's throne for himself and Budon's wife and cousin. Oh, Japan. Maltiwa. Oh yeah, just for some pointless trivia, the human form of Maltiwa is Hiromi Yuhara, who played one of the Child of the Week characters in Kamen Rider Black and was a monster's human form in Turbo Ranger. I guess I don't have any reason to talk though after what happened earlier. So let's just forget about that one.
Halfway through the series, we learn that Bacchus has a farm of techno-organic monsters in it, which is run by a beast tamer named Karis. Karis is played by Die Rangers Akiko Kuroso. <laughs> It is kind of cool to see Akiko again, especially because I believe this is her last appearance in any Sentai show. Which is a shame because she always had a great charisma about her. The foot soldiers are simply known as Bara soldiers. They start out as a really big threat that seemed like they could really kill the rangers. <laughs> Only to devolve into the standard beat em up squad. Oh, and as a callback to the Sentai of the 80s, they have their own little ships they fly around. Like all Sentai series before, each episode has its own monster of the week. My favorite one is interesting because only a selected few have human forms, and as such, Barakaka. <laughs> Ends up being my personal favorite due to the actor playing his human form. The man pulls off a variety of personalities and characters that really makes this monster stand out amongst the crowd. From a design perspective, I also love the designs of Bara Revenger and Bara Goblin. The Mecha. You want a mech? You got a mech. You want a mech? You got one too. You get a mech. You get a mech. And you get a mech. You know what? Everybody gets a mech. This is where things get really odd. As with Ju and Dai, the Rangers don't get their mecha until several episodes in, which really makes the first few episodes quite badass. Hell, Bacchus sends out a giant monster in the second episode and we get to watch the Rangers kick its ass without any giant robot support. That is pretty awesome. The first mech to enter the fray is All Ranger Robo. The individual machines are based on their Rangers' respective representation, and the combined form overall is pretty cool looking. <laughs> I also dig that he has multiple helmets from each of the heads of the standalone machines as each has its own purpose even if the yellow one seems a tad goofy. There isn't anything that makes him stand out compared to the machines of the past, but it still holds its own. The colors are pretty striking, and he doesn't look like a box as other mechs have been. Next up is Red Puncher, which is just a robot without anything to represent it from a mythological standpoint. It was a prototype, so that makes sense and I like the backstory behind it. A UAOH soldier lost his life trying to control the machine. So Goro has to learn how to do so in his stead. Things do get really wacky though when they start to train with it to be able to combine it with All Ranger Robo. Gotta get jiggy with it, that's it, the honey, honey, come ride. TK and Y, all up in my eyes, getting jiggy with it. Getting jiggy with it. What is even dumber is the way they acquire the code needed to combine. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I really just can't back the decision making on this one. Then we have King Pyramider, Ricky's mech. Basically think huge pyramid that All Ranger Robo can rest in. I love it. Can't do much, and the robot mode is pretty basic, but it's a freaking pyramid. Episode 33 introduces another mecha, O-Blocker. O-Blocker is quite lame because the individual robots are essentially just giant sized ranger symbols. There's nothing mythological about them. It's cool that they have individual ranger models that kind of mimic the actual rangers themselves, but in the end, it's pretty dumb and doesn't make sense. <laughs> However, that is nothing compared to the introduction of Tackle Boy in episode 36. What does a wheel transforming football bot have to do with mythology? Oh. Like the canon, he has no backstory and only appears in like three episodes. But wait. 
That's not all. In the episode after Tackle Boy's first appearance, we get Gun Majin, a genie-like robot that transforms into a mask. Even though it looks more like a tiki statue to me, but whatever. Think Ninja Man, but dumb. Gun Majin's concept doesn't even make sense because he won't grant wishes to villains even if they possess his key. <laughs> So why even bother? He only shows up when it's most convenient for the plot. A boy in trouble and the rangers are losing the battle? Gun Majin's key just magically flies in the hand of said child so he can wish him to help the rangers defeat the monster. I know, it's so strange. Stupid. Thankfully, Gun Majin is voiced by Akira Kamiya, who did Syncline and Go Lion. All in all, the mechs of the show are hit or miss. I like O Ranger Robo and King Pyramid. I don't hate Red Puncher, but the rest are pointless and really add nothing to the show. Toei and Bandai made up for the show's poor ratings with toy sales, and you can definitely see how desperate they were with them. All of them feel tacked on, especially Tackle Boy and Gun Majin. In fact, you should just call him Tackle Tacked On Boy. At least Gun Majin serves a purpose for the ending of the show, while Tacked On Boy does not. The episodes. Like the other categories of the show, even the episodes are really on equal footing with each other. And by that I mean there are just as many good episodes as there are bad episodes. Now when the show is good, it is really good. When it is bad though, oh my god, it is bad. My favorite episode is called The Terrifying School Nightmare. This episode deals with Momo having dreams about her best friend in elementary school who disappeared 11 years ago and is presumably dead. She encounters Bera Nightmare, a Bera monster who fled from the Empire over a decade ago and has been kidnapping schoolgirls since. The only thing missing now is for him to be a tentacle monster. Anyway, the rangers end up having to free Momo from Nightmare's Nightmare and rescue the kidnapped children. It is a really interesting and frightening episode, not just in plot, but even in its execution. Not only that, but it may even be one of the greatest episodes in the entire franchise. It's hard to describe exactly what makes this episode so good as it has to be seen to be understood. Oh, and this episode features no mech battles, which is a nice bonus. Now we come to the worst episode of the series, which is a hard pick due to how many terrible episodes there are. I was tempted to go with the aforementioned A Direct Hit with Flatulence, but I decided to go with the most cringe-inducing episode, which is Explosion of Baby. Good God, this episode is bad. Polarant decides to amp up the crying abilities of all the babies in Japan by using one of the ugliest looking Bera monsters in the entire series. The plot is just awful. The fights are awful. The effects work sucks. And the overall execution is just flat out terrible. Yeah, go ahead and cry your eyes out, you little the effects and music. Barring certain circumstances, if there is one thing this show does know how to do right, it is in its music and its effects work. The effects are really well done with some great camera work to boot. Fight scenes are not only pretty to watch, but they are also energetic thanks to the top-notch score provided. <laughs> There are a lot of magnificent tracks to please your ears and composer Seiji Yokoyama did a fantastic job at making up for the areas the show lacked. So when you are watching an episode and you feel like this... The moment Yokoyama's music starts, you are going to be like this.
Nobody's watching this, right? What? Oh crap. The opening song, Ole Ole Ranger, sung by Kentaro Hayami, is a really energetic theme that gets you into the mood of the show. Dash, dash, Likewise, King Q Hashin O Ranger closes out each episode with an upbeat melody that eases the viewer out of the show. Go, 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 o Ranger, the DVD. I'm not really sure at this point what else I could say differently that I didn't already say with Ju Dai and Gaku. I mean, it's exactly the same, the same type of DVDs. <laughs> The subtitles are white, just like the Cocker Ranger discs, and outside of a few spelling mistakes, I didn't notice anything inherently wrong with them. They even fixed the majority of the timing issues I had with Cocker Ranger, aside from like one line, and sometimes the to be continued subtitle for the end of an episode would appear a bit prematurely, but that is it. The movies. If you have been paying attention to the release of Dian Kaku, the movies for those series were not included on these releases, so it makes sense for O Ranger not to do the same. And, I mean, it kind of sucks, but it is just a separate license. Now, the strange thing was, there was a slimmer of hope that maybe the All Ranger movie would be on this set because when Saban did Power Ranger Zeal, they actually used footage from the movie, which they didn't do with Season 2 or 3. So, there was this slight hope that maybe it would be included, but clearly that's not the case because, again, just like Toei releases these on separate discs in Japan, it's, again, a second license. So, that was to be expected. Sadly, though, that does leave one really good joke in episode 31... Uh, lacking. これだ。このマシンジュだ。ジャグチャック。しかし、一度倒したはずだ。ええ、リサイクルですよ。Overall, though, the movie is just a bore fest to watch. It's 45 minutes long, but feels twice that length, and the plot is garbage. Bodon decides he wants to make a movie and captures a bunch of kids to get the Rangers to appear in his film. We get a bunch of new monsters, including the Fawcett one that will later reappear in episode 31. And while there are some cool action set pieces, the product as a whole is mediocre at best. It is also worth mentioning that the All Ranger movie is the last standalone feature length movie for a Sentai show until Gal Ranger in 2001. Now, but that does not mean that the movie's just ended there because actually All Ranger also started the yearly versus movie series, which has been going on since. They had All Ranger versus Kaku Ranger and then Car Ranger versus All Ranger. I'm going to actually not talk about Car Ranger versus All Ranger until the next review for Car Ranger, but. O Ranger vs. Cock Ranger is... interesting. It's a fun movie, but the editing is all over the place. There are scenes when the Rangers are fighting in a gravel pit one minute, but then are suddenly fighting over a waterfall in a forest in the next. The plot is not canonical in the slightest, and it features Bacchus and Budon competing with each other over who is the better ruler. Bacchus uses a standard Bara monster, while Budon uses a yokai. As such, the O-Rangers ask the Kaku Rangers for help. <laughs> I need an adult. I am an adult. Yeah. One of the biggest disappointments is that we get a Wild West scene with Sasuke and Surahime, but Jiraiya is nowhere to be found. It is pretty awesome watching both teams work together, despite neither of the Shoguns appearing for the final mech battle. Then again, with all of the O-Ranger mecha, it's not like there was any room for the Kaku Ranger ones. In the end, O-Ranger is a very polarizing Sentai series to watch. As I said, when it is good, it is really good. When it is bad, it is really bad. 
there are a lot of great and interesting ideas and concepts to be found. It is just that they get lost in poor development of the Ranger cast, crammed in mech battles, and a story that is really just flat out average. Nevertheless, I am going to give All Ranger three Grown Ups in Spandex out of five. Thankfully, it does have a lot of merits to really make it a standout show, especially in its final four episodes. It's just that the negatives really do outweigh the positives. Well, check it out. Another Sentai show done. Four down, 36 plus more to go. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, well, buy this DVD set so that Shop Factory can bring to us Car Ranger. Until next time, bye.